So a warm, very warm welcome to everyone to the first of our uh, first webinar of our webinar series that marks the, the launch of the job consolidation phase that will officially be starting on the 1st of uh, July. So there will be three presentations. Mine is a, a general overview presentation, so a little bit on the background of Yop, just a reminder for those of you who are new. Um, and uh, I will be talking a bit of successes, you know, and some highlights from the core phase, but you will be hearing much more in the, in the, uh, the other two webinars that will be um, later today and uh, tomorrow, um, tomorrow morning. Um, UTC time um, and then I will be spending a bit of time in explaining to you you know what we are planning to do in the YOP consolidation phase which in summary is really you know trying to you know go from research and from observations and uh, you know better understanding to advanced predictions and polar regions and beyond. Okay, so very brief reminder, the year of polar prediction, you see the mission statement here. It's about enabling a significant improvement in environmental prediction capabilities for the polar regions and beyond by coordinating a period of intensive, intensive observation, modeling, verification, user engagement, and education activities. So there are a few things I would like to highlight here. Number one is it's about environmental prediction. So it's not just weather, it's not the atmosphere, you know, especially in polar regions, considering the coupled system from the atmosphere, sea ice, ocean, and snow is absolutely critical. It's not about just improving predictions in polar regions, but also in mid latitudes. And we think there's reason to believe that there are linkages, and I will be coming back to this later on in the presentation. And then there is this intense period, you know, focusing our resources and efforts on especially the core phase uh, of the year of polar prediction, where a lot of the activities will take place. But it's going to continue in the op consolidation phase, as I will outline during the course of this presentation. Here's a bit of a timeline, okay, starting basically with the launch of the polar prediction project in 2011 and then you know touching on the you know, the dots mark the the beginnings of the different of the three phases of the year of polar prediction the preparation phase the core phase and the consolidation phase but i think really you know what 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 was the cause for you know for for wmo or the probably the main reason for wmo to establish the polar prediction project and hence the year of polar prediction was the the decline in arctic sea ice you know, uh, and especially this record-breaking summer in 2007, you know, where which looks really like an amazing hour outlier, and certainly it looked like that back then. And at that time, also the World Weather, you know, the the World Meteorological Organization and the World Weather Research Program, they were sort of looking into the future and what kind of projects, you know, would be worthwhile given certain developments. And uh, polar prediction is certainly something that moved into the focus because it became clear that there will be lots of, um, lots of you know, economic activities you know, coming along with climate change. And people felt that the predictive information in order to you know, manage the risks that come with that was not um, um, up to the job. So that's why basically the polar prediction project was launched. We did have a launch meeting in 2011, and I think it's always amazing looking back that you know how how long we are working on this, or how long we are working on uh, on this already. So this is a photo here from the launch meeting on the 30th of no November 2011, a year before I left the European Centre to come to the Alfred Bigner Institute. So from operational prediction centre, going to research centre on polar prediction, they asked me to chair the steering group, and I thought it was a, an amazing opportunity. Uh, and I took this on. Now at that meeting, we realized, you know, we were in terms of prediction in the early, to, well, in 2011, certainly, you know, it was really the very beginning and we needed something like a 10 year project with a core phase where we, you know, where, where, we, where we put together our resources in order to really make a progress. But we also realized that, you know, not just thinking about the core phase of measuring and running models, but we needed to properly prepare this. So we also you know, put together a preparation phase. And importantly also, we needed to allocate time after the core phase you know, to make sense and most of the data and the knowledge that you know, was generated and still being generated in, in response um, of the core phase. And that led us then to the consolidation phase, whose introduction is the main purpose of my presentation today. 
very briefly, you know, when it comes to launching, the, I mean, probably the, 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 really the launch event for the preparation phase took you know, took place in 2015 when we had a YOP summit. It was in the middle of the summer season and more than 200 of the leading scientists and operational forecasters and social scientists came to Geneva, you know, talking about this, uh, uh, the YOP core phase in particular. And I think back then we realized, you know, this is going to fly. And especially we realized that also the Southern Hemisphere component of the op, you know, related to the Antarctica is going to fly. That was certainly, you know, the launch event for the preparation phase, I would say. Coming to the launch event for the core phase, you know, we made it a bit bigger. We had press conference, you know, you see a snapshot from here. Over here, we presented this at, um, at the Executive Council of uh, WMO. And, uh, you know, they had quite some impact uh, uh, back then. And actually this webinar series, and that's why I'm putting all this up, can be considered the launch event for the YOP consolidation phase. As I mentioned, you know, it will be three webinars, uh, this one uh, basically being the first one. Okay, um, so let me start then and, you know, present you a few highlights from the core phase. And as I said, you know, there will be more presented by Irinos, Irina Sandu later today and by Greg Smith tomorrow in the, in the subsequent webinars. And I think one of the success stories was really the endorsement process that we launched during the YOP preparation phase. And sort of in the middle of the YOP core phase, we had a, a total of 82 projects that were endorsed by YOP. Now, this is important to have this endorsed project because this is a way of communicating with the PIs and the scientists in the projects. And uh, having 82 of them is certainly uh, amazing. And, you know, some of them are rather big with, you know, having funding in, in excess of something like 8 million euros, uh, such as Applicate or, or Blue Action, for example. Here they are stratified, you know, these projects according to the Arctic, the upper panel, upper part, the Antarctic, the lower one, the left one, the atmosphere, right, the ocean, and color coding, blue indicating observations, red modeling, um, greenish uh, social sciences, and so forth. I don't want to go into too much detail, but I think in principle, things are very well populated across hemispheres and, you know, the atmosphere, sort of Earth system components. There is, however, a bit of a gap, which we are starting to close now also with, you know, certain em emphasis we put during the consolidation phase, but there's still probably a bit of a gap when it comes to the ocean in the southern, uh, uh, southern hemisphere. What we also, you know, was quite critical, especially at the outset of the project, what to, was to establish a baseline. When we started in 2011, it was absolutely not clear how well actually existing operational models perform in, 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 you know, in, in predicting weather and environmental conditions in polar regions. And I think we have learned a lot recently in this. And I would like to give you one more recent example. It's from a work by Lorenzo Zampieri. Um, and what he did was he considered the skill of so-called subseasonal prediction systems and predicting the ice edge in the Arctic. So what you see is here on the y-axis is a forecast error in predicting the Arctic, uh, sort of the Arctic as a sea ice edge in the Arctic. The larger the value, the larger the error, the bigger the error. And here you see lead time. So this is a 10-day forecast, 20-day forecast here and so forth on the x-axis, x-axis. And you also see here benchmark forecast. There's this solid line here that goes up very steep that starts with very low values and then rapidly increases that's persistent so taking as a forecast conditions you know on the day where the forecast starts um so good very good initially and then rather poor um, further on into the forecast and the other benchmark here is a climatological forecast so saying you know the forecast will look like climatological conditions and we are really looking for forecasts here in this sector below these two curves uh, because that's where you know the forecast systems are more skillful than you know sort of relatively straightforward benchmark forecasts and you see different curves here these are you know the, the results for different forecasting centers and probably the most amazing and obvious thing is that you know the the, the structure of the curves and the performance of the different models is widely different you know i mean some models you know not having even skill to start with uh, and um, and um, other models you know um, like the ecmwf model here showing skill in predicting forecast out to 40 days and even longer 
And the fact that, you know, the forecasts are so different, you know, tells us that still now Nowadays, we are in a relatively premature stage of, you know, sub-seasonal prediction of Arctic sea ice. Okay, um, and the currently Lorenzo carried out a similar analysis for Antarctica, and generally the, the skill is not as high as in the Arctic, but uh, the, the, the general structure and the picture we'll see here is valid for the Antarctic as well. Um, another one of the selected highlights are certainly the special observing periods. So what we wanted to do in the Arctic and the Antarctic during certain periods, you know, try as much as possible to fill the gap in the observing system that's so striking in, in polar regions. And uh, the first one was actually the winter one from 1st of February to the 31st of March 2018. And we had in total more than one thousand almost 2,000 extra radio sounds from 16 different sites involving seven nations, but we also had buoys and, you know, um, um, and special, you know, um, observational campaigns and others. I think that was really a success. We did have another one very comparable in terms of extra observations for summer, you know, in 2018. And then this Southern Hemisphere uh, summer season, we also had a very, very successful special observing period. Uh, again, with a very similar number of extra observations. So I think in terms of, you know, food for carrying out experiments now, um, I think we are very well positioned after those special observing periods. Some preliminary results, and I'm sure Irina will be elaborating on this, is, uh, you know, to, is are these observing system experiments that is, that is using full uh, forecasting experiments to see what the value of certain parts of the observing systems are. And this is very important to provide guidance, you know, where to invest, what are the critical parts of the observing system that give skill and anchor the system. And here are some preliminary results, and I invite you, probably, I mean, Irina will be elaborating on this later on. So this is from Lawrence et al. from ECMWF, funded in the context of Applicate, an EU project. And uh, what you see is here, the increase in forecast error for the Arctic if you take out certain parts of the observing system. MW indicates microwaves, con conventional observation, IR, infrared data, GPS data, and atmospheric motion winds. And what you see is in summer for the Arctic, if you take out microwaves, then the impact in deteriorating forecast is the largest, amounting up to something like 10% larger errors, followed by conventional observations and infrared uh, observations. So the impact of observations is quite sizable there. Now, what happens to the forecast skill in mid-latitudes if you withhold, withhold observations in the Arctic, in the Arctic only? And that's shown here, and you see a moderate increase in forecast errors in mid-latitudes you know, uh, of something like two to three percent, perhaps depending on the observing system. Now this, uh, you know, it's moderate increase, but you also have to consider that probably this impact on mid latitude doesn't necessarily happen on every single day with something like two percent, but there are certain flow regimes, you know, when the impact is felt more strongly. So uh, there's a very strong flow dependence. And there's a, as a paper by, um, 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 you know, that will be coming out as well, that we'll be elaborating a little bit on this. Interestingly, withholding the same type of observations in the Arctic in winter generally, you know, has not such a big impact in the Arctic itself, shown here. So, you know, taking out all the conventional observations increases forecast errors, for example, by just over 2% only, which is relatively little. And I think which is a sign, which is a reflection of the fact that the Arctic atmosphere and weather forecast, you know, they are strongly determined by what's happening in terms of the weather in mid-latitudes. You know, there's a very strong connection from mid-latitudes into the Arctic during boreal winter. And I think that's something that is reflected here. And therefore, probably also the, you know, the impact of, you know, reduced forecast skill in the Arctic. It is felt in mid-latitudes, but less so than it is during the summer season. And again, you know, there will probably be more, more, more about this uh, in subsequent webinars. I just want to mention, I think in terms of, these are experiments with one forecasting system, but that is an activity that is highly coordinated around, among, uh, across modeling centers involving ECMWF, 
um, um, ECCC, Environment and Climate Change Canada, Met Norway, the German Weather Service and others. And they are all withholding exactly the same type of information. And then we can see how dependent our conclusions are on the forecasting system used. And I think this will probably provide really outstanding guidance for the development of the observing system. Another topic related, I touched a bit on this, um, is, um, is the importance of Arctic mid-latitude linkages. So the question, you know, what happens in the Arctic, rapid Arctic, you know, Arctic amplification, basically, does it impact lower latitudes or more general polar amplification? And uh, the problem is a little bit, you know, but if you look at observations, it suggests there's a very strong link. You know, if you, if you look at correlations, they seem to be high, you know, sea ice is changing in, in, in the Arctic and there has been an increase of you know, blocking type situations. Um, but uh, establishing causality is rather challenging. Now, if you look at model results and screen the literature, then you find actually that generally, you know, there is a, there's, there's a, a family, you know, a spectrum of responses are reported in the literature. And this PA MIP, this Polar Amplification Model Intercomparison Project that contributes to CMIP 6 is actually meant to provide a protocol that different modeling groups run the same type of experiments that we can say and distinguish between, you know, differences in the response that depend on, you know, the way our models are formulated versus, you know, uh, the experimental design. And I would like to give you just a very brief glimpse at the first results. Noting, in fact, that uh, the PA MIP workshop, the first major international PA MIP workshop, will be starting today in Exeter. And probably this is together with the YOP Southern Hemisphere meeting that will be taking place, I think, on Wednesday or Thursday in Charleston in the US, will be the last two meetings of the YOP core phase. And what you see is here for the Met Office model, for the German model, ECAM 6, and for US model with a very high res highly resolved uh, stratosphere, you see the response in terms of temperatures here when uh, when you take future compared to present day sea ice conditions and what you see is here left column is temperature you see a very strong uh, temperature warming close to the surface which is reminiscent of uh, uh, arctic amplification um, and uh, then you see some differences in the response in the stratosphere, you know, where probably uncertainty is quite high. On the right hand side, you see uh, changes in the zonal winds and uh, where you see the climatological winds indicated here by contour lines. You have the subtropical jetty on the northern hemisphere, on the southern hemisphere, and then a little bit blurred, you have the polar jet sitting to the north of that and doesn't show up, you know, as a single maximum here because it fluctuates, fluctuates so strongly. But what you see is around 50 degrees north, all the models are telling us westerly winds are going to decrease, okay? And there's a generally a sort of a, an equator ward shift in response to anticipated future Arctic sea ice decline. Uh, so that's interesting. One needs to say, though, that the response itself is not overly strong. And one needs to say that certainly the results we looked at at the Alfred Wigner Institute, this is a zonal average zonal wind, so some of the, you know, what happens um, across the whole northern hemisphere. If you look at something like waviness of the atmosphere, which is associated and describes sort of, you know, more uh, uh, fluctuating uh, jet stream events, we don't see a, a strong change in the statistics of those, in those experiments. But again, there's a currently workshop going on this week in Exeter, and I'm, I'm quite excited and looking forward to see what the co key conclusions from that will be. And this will be, this PA MIP kind of experiments will be feeding into the next IPCC assessment report that will be started, the writing that will be started next year. I would like to mention and make advertisement also already in view of the YOP consolidation phase. There, there are exciting YOP model data sets out there. For example, ECMWF provides their coupled operational forecasting, ensemble forecasting system uh, data for the whole YOP core phase. And I think there are plans for extending this even to cover Mosaic, the biggest Arctic expedition ever. And here the, the interesting bit is also that we have process tendencies. So, you know, the, the tendency temperature changes and advection and, and uh, for example, due to different physical processes like convection, vertical diffusion and others. So that is really a data set that allows you to explore predictability, but also physical processes. Then we have a very nice data set provided by Environment and Climate Change Canada here from the Canadian Arctic Prediction System. Again, you know, high resolution forecast, uh, you know, that 
provide a unique opportunity to evaluate the skill of uh, um, prediction systems, state-of-the-art prediction systems and polar region, including CI, so that's a coupled system. And also uh, NIL in the US, they provided high resolution, in this case, one kilometer um, CI's forecast, which again, I think, you know, for scientists, for PhD students, master students, provides a, a very nice data, data set to provide and contribute to the to the to the goals of the year of polar prediction. Last but not least, I would mention that you know the steering group um, of the polar prediction project, which is in charge of the planning and um, you know an overlooking of the year of polar prediction, um, that is, has undergone some changes naturally. You know, some people step down after after many years, and uh, we do have some very very you know, active new members: Tanel Utal, Michael Lamas, and Irina Sandu pictured all here and Irina will be giving the second webinar later today. Okay. Which brings me um, to the job consolidation phase. Okay. And uh, uh, much of what I will be describing now came basically out of the last two meetings of the PPP steering group, one in Reykjavik in 2018, spring 20 or late winter, well, it was actually late winter 2018. And more recently in Helsinki, I think it was in January, so it should read 2019 here. And uh, so that were the main planning meetings. And, um, you know, I will be giving an, an overview, but I would like to indicate already that all these things I'm going to present are also be, will be part of the version three of the job implementation plan, which has a revised section on the job consolidation phase, and that will be published in July 2019. Okay, and we will, we will inform everyone once that document becomes available. Now, in brief, the job consolidation phase has six different elements. I mean, what we, the first element, consolidating job research from research to operations, uh, job coordination, communication and outreach, creating a job legacy and determining success. And I would like, what I would like to do now in the remaining 10, 15 minutes or so, I want to briefly go through you know, the different elements and give you a flavor of what we are planning to do. Starting with the job consolidating or consolidating job research, I think the first most important aspect to say is, you know, um, research continues in many regards, okay? I mean, I think we are far from finishing, you know, basic research related to polar prediction. I mean, that's something that is ongoing. I think talking about consolidating job research indicates that you know we are planning and it's we are invited. I think everyone is invited, you know, to make use of the things that the, uh, that were developed and provided to the community as part of the core phase, in order to move things forward. And I would like to give you some examples of you know what the, the, this consolidating job research in, entails. We invite, for example, the community to take up the job model data sets to make progress, you know, in our understanding of, you know, predictability of the system, but also in strength and weaknesses of models and in, you know, the processes that actually govern state-of-the-art uh, models. All this will be available with the, will be possible with the available data sets. We provide special data sets, and that is work that is still in progress, the so-called job site map. I mean, for spe specific super sites, you know, the community will be provided with high resolution observational data that are matched at these sites with high resolution model data, which facilitates a very, you know, thorough uh, comparison of, you know, processes, but also action skill between, you know, of models and uh, uh, with observations. Now, Mosaic, you know, from the outset when we started the planning of the year of polar prediction, it was always clear to us that the year of polar prediction and Mosaic, whose planning started pretty much at the same time in the you know, around 2011, 2012, you know, we always thought, thought you know, these two things have to be aligned. Given that, you know, Mosaic is providing really, you know, process understanding of the coupled system in the interior of the Arctic under sort of new Arctic conditions, which is you know, critical for advancing our models, whereas YOP, you know, is providing important information, it providing sort of the community and the expertise, you know, that can pick up the data and turn this into better forecast, but YOP also providing the larger scale picture of things. So, you know, analysis of the mosaic data, which 
you know, then should be leading into you know, significant model enhancement is a key element as well, as is the verification of forecast. Um, you know, experiments that provide us with you know insight into the development and improvement of the observing system, like this observing system experiments, work on polar lower latitude linkages is highly recommended. And also social, social science um, research. And there are plans, for example, to hold special services periods and workshops that bring, um, you know, that bring providers and users of forecasts uh, together. So, you know, research in YOP very much strongly continues uh, throughout the YOP consolidation phase. That brings me to the second element from research to operations and services. Um, what, you know, we are, can exploit and rely on is actually the strong engagement of operational centers and their engagement in job. Uh, and I always thought, you know, this was a major major advantage, perhaps, to some other programs in, uh, that we, you know, that we have the buy-in from the major operational centers in, you know, supporting our activities, but also taking things up, knowledge, you know, and then potentially implement this here. So, you know, the ambition is to implement key outcomes of the year of polar prediction during the consolidation phase and of course also beyond in operational systems. Um, we want to make recommendations uh, for polar stakeholders, you know, and especially in terms of, you know, the service component. And uh, this is uh, not just one way, but we want to also, you know, engage with uh, users and uh, take on their feedback. Which brings me to the third element, job coordination. And I think the good news is for those involved that uh, there will be continued support um, of the year of polar prediction through the International Coordination Office that is hosted by the Alfred Wigner Institute. Uh, and the, the, the underpinning of this is the renewal of the memorandum of understanding between WMO and the Alfred Wigner Institute. And that gives us the funding you know, to run the ICO until the end of 2022, uh, at which then uh, the year of polar prediction and the polar uh, prediction project will come to an end. There will be continued coordination, of course, through the, the steering group of the polar prediction project. And importantly, we have also revised and adjusted our task teams, our job task teams, you know, that targets have specific tasks and, and, and um, uh, that they have to carry out and oversee and implement. And uh, I would like to very briefly go through these different task teams that are there. Some of them, you know, were there already, you know, during the core phase, some of them uh, being new. And we have a core a, a task team that is dedicated to sea ice prediction and verification, and that's led by Helge Gössling and, uh, and Greg Smith. We have one on numerical experimentation, which is led by Adina Sandu, and there the focus is pretty much on um, especially initially on uh, coordinated ob observing system experiments. We have a, um, an, a strong task team that was there already for some time, led by Barbara Casati on verification. We have one on atmospheric processes where Job site map on the link to Mosaic has its home, and that's Gunilla Svensson and Tanay Utal. And then we have the Job Southern Hemisphere, again, one that is well established and uh, run by David uh, Bromwich. And as I said, this week, I think on Wednesday or, or Thursday, they will be meeting in, in Charleston, you know, to, um, uh, to continue their planning and looking at the outcome of the first outcomes of uh, uh, the Job core phase. We have our YOP PPV CIRA team, where you know, societal and economic research applications and you know, social scientists meet. We have a YOP data task team uh, and uh, a communication outreach education task team. And then last but not least, we have a team that's planning the, the final summit of YOP that will be held in 2022, probably in Montreal, and I will be coming back to this. And we also have a task team that looks at the success and evaluates job. And again, I will be coming back to that. Now, in principle, I should say, you know, the information about the revised task team should be available uh, soon through the Polar Prediction website that I guess most of you know. And I would say that, you know, if you are keen on contributing to you know, any of those task teams, then you are invited to contact us and. Uh, um, you know, support and contribution here is, is highly solicited, especially, you know, when it comes to, you know, and being a bit self-critical, probably, you know, the 
the most tricky part is to you know to develop the your data component um, and uh, especially there in this area when it comes to data data management data legacies you know input from the community here um, is highly desirable communication and outreach um, you know we carry out targeted and focused outreach activities and uh, we disseminate job knowledge through conferences meetings and social media to in a way you know continue um, a model that turned out to be quite successful during the job core phase and of course we also educate you know people and um, i should have mentioned probably i didn't that we did have you know a, a quite successful polar prediction summer school um, last summer so sort of last spring last year uh, in the north of sweden you know where people you know got insight into observing, into modeling, and also into theory related to polar prediction. And I guess that was quite um, uh, quite acknowledged. Now, we did have recently in the International Coordination Office a bit of a you know, strategy retreat where we discussed where to put our foci. And you know, this summarizes it, basically. Uh, and that also takes into account feedback that we've got from a survey that was carried out at the Helsinki Science Polar Prediction Science Workshop that was held earlier this year. And uh, so most of the people take their information either from the website or from the mailing list, and you know, that we are going to you know, make sure that they are you know, um, always up to date. And um, uh, so this has a very high priority, as has uh, social media activity that will be probably, you know, um, ramped up a little bit. We will continue with our newsletter. We have, I think, 11 in total right now, and we are pretty much on course of having one every three months. Um, and, um, and then, you know, especially when it comes to engaging with the users, polar prediction matters is something that we are going to continue uh, strongly. A very important aspect as well of our strategy is, you know, to you know, to show faces and um, you know, bring people that are involved in 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 job uh, to the forefront, you know, to fill really job with life and make it make it more tangible. So that's part of the strategy as well. Another important element during the job consolidation phase is uh, preparing a job legacy. I mean, job will be finalizing, finishing at the end of 2022. Uh, but I think we are all aware of the fact that, you know, uh, there is still scope beyond that period uh, for improving polar prediction capacity. And uh, probably there's also scope by, you know, benefiting from the ground that that uh, Job has laid. Uh, and so I think this is something we want to take into and uh, you know, to work on here. So the, the ambition is to create a legacy beyond 2022. Uh, and for this, we need to discuss POPs possible legacy activities with uh, WMO, you know, perhaps there's something like another or something related, related polar prediction type project, but we also need to discuss this beyond WMO. We need to identify key partners that have a longer lifetime than, than the Polar Prediction Project and you know, all its committees. So we have to identify key partners that can actually carry on some of the work when it comes to coordination, when it comes to science, when it comes to providing certain data sets. Uh, so this has to have a high priority. And related to this, we have to ensure availability of key infrastructures beyond 2022, which may require actually some funding, such as the Polar Prediction website, you know, that there's hub of information of key outcomes from, uh, uh, from the Polar Prediction project and job will be updated and available for the community to check. But also things like the job data portal probably need a, a merit a much longer a lifetime than uh, uh, than the end of 2022 and we're working on that um, as we speak and importantly as well for creating the job legacy and i would like to you know for for those of you who are very interested in job um, indicate already that there will be a job final summit in 2022 you know especially when it comes to you know measuring success of this and you know talking and deciding what the legacy will be but also seeing what the highlights scientifically and uh, in terms of outcomes are this will be the, the key event uh, and that will be held uh, um, tentatively in montreal in, in, in summer 2022 and the fact that it will be in montreal will, is also acknowledging the fact that environment and climate change canada has been always very strong and supportive in in terms of um, 
the polar prediction project and uh, and the year of polar prediction uh, okay and then um, i think that's the last element is determining success um, so we have to determine in the next few months measures how we would like to measure success or failure um, uh, we need to identify you know success stories that probably can't be you know um, measured easily by by simple metrics which is more the first bullet point and with this then we evaluate the overall success of uh, of yop and we you know we are very happy to be extremely self critical here um, so that includes actually you know determining areas where yop may have failed okay and uh, uh, and this is important you know determining success but also you know identifying areas where there's scope for improvement when it comes to formulating recommendations for follow on activity be there be it under the umbrella of wmo somehow or in different parts so that we can say after 10 years of polar prediction related research what works well and what can be done better next time you know should some a similar kind of you know large scale activity be established and probably you know this is something you know the lessons learned here could also be transferred to you know similar type of activities perhaps related to sort of having more focus in other regions like the tropics and mid latitudes so it should be fairly general what comes out in terms of recommendations here <clears throat> so this brings me to a very concise summary slide here so I think, in my view, um, the YOP core phase has been a success. Again, success will be measured, and uh, perhaps it's a bit premature, but I'm quite optimistic, you know, in terms of what I've seen thus far, um, that things work well. Now, when it comes to the consolidation phase, and especially the transfer of research into operations and services, probably this is, uh, you know, uh, something that is challenging, uh, and we have to see how we are going to do in that regard. Um, the planning for the job consolidation phase has been finalized. Doesn't mean that it is carved in stone. If there are good, good ideas, we are flexible. And uh, the details, um, they will be available soon through the job implementation plan, the, the third version, which should be coming available to the community in July 2019. We are currently putting final touches to the document and then will be typeset. Uh, typeset at the WMO and then we, we share it with the community. Importantly though, um, this will be flanked by you know, updates, especially when it comes to the task teams, you know, this will be much more elaborated on the Polar Prediction Net website. So that's really, you know, these two things together should provide you with, uh, with really comprehensive information on the plans, but also especially the second, the Polar Prediction website on the progress as we go along. So and I think really, you know, that we have two and a half more exciting years of uh, yacht ahead of us, and I'm looking forward to this. Which brings me to my very last slide, and uh, this is a snapshot from my Twitter, uh, my Twitter account this morning. Uh, and just to remind you that later today, uh, Irina will be reporting on some results in the context of uh, yacht from ECMWF, and then tomorrow. Um, at 5.15 UTC, Greg Smith will be talking about the, uh, the experience and uh, you know, um, the work that Environment and Climate Change Canada has done uh, in terms of the year of polar prediction. And with this, um, I close here and I'm happy to take questions. Um, okay, so I have a reminder um, of Jeff actually that we have uh, three and a half years of your six months in 2019 then we have 2020 2021 and 2022 absolutely right jeff thank you very much for um for letting us know if you do have any question you know and you would like to contact us later on feel free to do so uh, with this then i close our first webinar and uh, thank everyone for tuning in and uh, thank you very much for your time. And again, I remind you that more webinars will be coming later today and tomorrow. So bye-bye everyone and thank you.